boost robotic surgery in in conjunction with with humans and robots and also in some experimental surgeries robots per se then or they can virtual robotics virtual robotics and virtual ai can be used in planning the treatment uh, of a patient so whether it's good for medical fraternity or it's bad for medical fraternity we'll come to that later but then today our role and today our discussion point here is to assess whether how ai can be used in risk assessment of future events in in a benign in a virgin patients and in a cardiovascular patients how can it predicts the recurrence of future events well why do we need to predict risk in cardiovascular diseases i think it's important because many a times we have we, we need to give fair advice many a times uh, an anxious patient may walk inside their opd and ask uh, what to do i uh, you know i i fear that i may have cardiac disease i fear that i may develop cardiovascular disease what are the set of investigations that need to be done many a times they are you know non judiciously prescribed tmts and ct ngos which which hardly help us in any which way in predicting the cardiovascular events of the future but still they are advised so many a times if we if we have cardiovascular risk scoring system whether ai based or whether normal based we can give a fair advice to the patient that your risk of developing a cardiovascular event is low is intermediate or is high uh, if you have a high risk or a intermediate risk patient we can we can tell these patients to improve their compliance for risk factor modification for lowering of uh, the ldl for for quitting of tobacco so all the lifestyle modifications and pharmacological uh, compliances can be made improved if we know what exactly is the risk profile of a future event in a particular patient and of course the risk scoring system can also be used for prognostication of the patient now there are apart from the ai risk scoring systems that we will speak as the as the presentation goes we already have a host of other risk prediction models in cardiovascular diseases for example the framingham heart risk scores the q risk scores the who risk scores the ascvd risk scores these risk scores take into consideration anywhere between seven risk factors in the who risk scores and 12 risk factors in the ascvd and the q risk scores and they have this online computing tables where you can go to these websites and calculate the risk factors of any individual so these risk scores are already available for a long period of time with the physicians and we have been using these risk scores then are they sufficient what are they what are their pitfalls and then we can come back to to, to realizing whether we need artificial intelligence risk scores per se so there are many pitfalls of cardiovascular risk prediction models as they are present today that use only clinical parameters and simple calculations because the risk factor selection in these risk models risk assessment models were picked on the focus study group and they were not broad based there were many risk factors were missing in each one of them and we will come to that later very importantly if, and 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 it's a important point for us to remember that whenever we predict a risk based upon these traditional risk scores it's a fixed system what happens to these patients when we have when we have risk stratified them how these patients behave over 5 years 10 years period of time and can we use that experience to bring some sort of feedback system in the loop so that it improves our future prediction that is nowhere in these clinical risk scoring systems there is no active feedback these are fixed stationary systems that do not judge themselves as the time goes forward whether they are accurate or they were not accurate and they have traditionally been found to be less accurate in populations that were not uh, used to make these algorithms for, for example many of these risk scoring systems do not apply to the indian population and we have to have some sort of adjustment scoring systems for indian populations and then these risk scoring systems many a times are not proved in prospective clinical trials have not produced the same kind of results in the prospective clinical trials as they have in the initial model so we do need a a new a modern looking and a very very um, you know uh, futuristic kind of uh, risk prediction model for cardiovascular diseases because it's a global number one clear and here comes the role of the ai cardiovascular risk scoring systems also importantly most of these risk scores that are already available have confusing nomenclature some would use low moderate high or very high risk someone would use low intermediate high risk someone would use low borderline intermediate high risk so we end up confusing the physician and patients more than we end up helping them 
Now, uh, of course, there are many, many artificial intelligence-based cardiovascular risk scoring systems that are now available globally, but I would speak only about one of them uh, that I have personal experience with, and this was developed by Microsoft in conjunction with the um, with Apollo Group of Hospitals, as well as a consortium of academic institutions from across the world, from Europe, Australia, US, and in India, two centers that were part of that consortium were all India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi and KDMU in, in Lucknow. And here what was done was a top 50 most frequently measured parameters of cardiovascular disease in health checkups and lab reports of patients were selected, and they were subjected to a very complex set of statistics. And 22 of those factors were selected to form a part of this model of AI-based models. And these two 22 factors, when put in the deep neural networks, give us this risk scoring system of these patients. And it was seen that when these 22 clinical risk factors were used in an AI-based algorithm of deep neural networking and machine learning, it was seen that the area under of curve was 0.83, which was, which was much, much better than the Framingham risk score, which had an area under the curve of 0.47. You see here how the AI CVD risk scoring system is different from the traditional risk scoring system. We have many, many new parameters that were included that do not form part of the traditional risk scoring systems like dietary habit, alcohol consumption, oral tobacco consumption, diastolic blood pressure, physical activities. These were all part of the AI CVD risk scoring system because it had 22 parameters as compared to seven, eight or 12 parameters uh, uh, that were used in the earlier risk scoring systems. And also important that it can be applied to a much wider population base because many of these earlier risk factors were applied to a certain patient age group. For example, the WHO uh, ISH risk scoring system is only applicable to people 40 years or older. It cannot be applied to younger population where we are seeing that a lot of patients nowadays are coming up coming to us with acute coronary syndrome in their 20s and their 30s. And here, as you can see, that AICVD risk scoring system, artificial intelligence-based cardiovascular risk, risk scoring system is, is, is applicable to both from a range of 20 years to a 90 years. And just to give you an example how this system works, for example, um, for example, if we were using these seven, eight parameters that are mentioned here, in simple multiple regression model, we could have come up with the data that a diabetic tobacco consumption person with a high BMI is more prone to a further event. You know, it was it was discrete. One, zero and one discrete phenomena were used. But then how, uh, for those just to, I don't know if I'm making it more complex or more simple, but for example, how do you find out what is the risk profile of a 35-year-old diabetic male who's oral tobacco consumer but whose LDL levels are normal versus a 50-year man who's a non-diabetic, who's hypertensive, and cigarette. So when you when you put these in continuous variables, then the calculation becomes comprehensive. And through the layer of computing, an output layer given. Actually, the output you get put up into the computer for that age, and you get that patient's risk score. Now, how do you classify low, moderate, and high risk is if the patient risk score is less than one times, that is less than the optimal risk score, he's low risk, he or she is low risk. If the patient risk score is 1 to 1.5 of the optimal risk score for his age, then it's the patient is a moderate risk patient for the future events. And if the patient is 1 5 more than the optimal risk score for his or her, his or her age, then the patient is high risk for future events of cardiovascular disease. For example, this is, this is a tablet in which we enter this data and you see the optimal score for this patient was two. This patient's risk score came out to be four, which was two times the optimal. The patient was high risk for vascular events. And when you control these events, patient's score comes down this four and become three. So it's a dynamic risk scoring system that can change over one condition. 
get smarter as you use the system. So it's predictability for 10,000 patients when you use it for 10,000 patients would be better than use it for 1,000 patients. And when you use it for 1 lakh patients would be much better than 10,000 patients. So it's a very dynamic and a robust kind of a system. It's been seen that when compared to other risk scores, the sensitivity and specificity of AICVD risk scoring system, and it's been published by us, is, is 60% and 90%, while as from Framingham, the sensitivity is 37% and 82%. A couple of studies that we did, uh, young patients 40 years old, younger, there we calculated the risk scoring systems traditionally risk scores. And what we found that these young young patients that score were classified as moderate or high risk by AICVD risk scoring system. Mean you look at the patients for young individuals who already had an acute coronary syndrome. Now, had an occurrence of coronary syndrome. Very smart. If classified them as by by the various things, but by CS as moderate to higher. is from happening. So this is a hypothetical generating study, but of course would from prospective manner to see to see to do like this is a study that we did. What is the impact of intense lifestyle changes on, on the AI based risk scoring system over a period of time. And here, 312 patients we studied, and this CVD risk score, uh, risk category in the bit was minimal, that is low risk, moderate for 116 patients, and high for 93 patients. When we subjected patients of risk will became low, will remain in the low risk, but out of the 116 patients in moderate risk, half actually patients, 108 out of them, 93% of them from moderate shifted to minimal. And, and, uh, and, and similarly for the high, high individuals at baseline, when subjected to intense lifestyle moment of this 93, one change from high to low category, 79 change from high to moderate category, and 13 patients remain in moderate category. So out of when when earlier, there were 93 patients in the high risk category, with the introduction of intense lifestyle modification, only 13 remained at the end of six months. So we, it gives us a sense of idea that when we are treating these patients for the hypertension, diabetes, LDL, and we are taking care of all these 21, 22 risk factors, making these patients aware, then we do decrease the risk of future events in these patients also whether the AI based systems or advanced computing will will change how we practice and will replace the physicians because now the AI and computers can diagnose the disease can can uh, deciding the treatment plan for the patient so it is going to replace the doctors that's what the common terms is the AI based radiologist going to replace the radiologist of the future the answer is no but as I would like to end by saying that AI is not going to replace doctors, but then going forward in future, doctors without the use of artificial intelligence um, will be replaced by those doctors who use advanced computing uh, like artificial intelligence in their practice. So that's, that's, that's a, maybe an awareness or a warning to all of us to move forward and, and look forward and use technology to the best of our interest and, and make the life of ourselves and patients better. I thank you for your attention. Hello, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Siti sir, to deliver a nice talk on the artificial intelligence and cardiac risk stratification. Now the session is open for the question answer. If any question, then please.
perhaps uh, there is no question thank you i think uh, uh, have uh, we have uh, the population from our uh, kgmc institute we have studied that aicvd score uh, which we have told sir uh, aicvd score which uh, which is based on artificial intelligence yes 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 so it was yes so so um, the uh, in conjunction with all the existing databases that they had available for india and overseas but it was tested in smaller studies that we are talked about two studies in our own patient population in kgmu both the studies are talked about done in kgmc also and now we are part of a consortium that are doing a prospective in in patient with coronary syndrome and to see whether it predicts it uh, in future also can you see the role of artificial intelligence in uh, coronary angiogram in to uh, use this technology coronary angiogram interpretation because always there is so, a so um is definitely being uh, studied as part of the ai algorithm the ct a lot of models are available to diagnose ct coronary angiogram without the use of a radiologist what is the disease pattern like so ct is already there and going forward i'd see no reason why uh ct so not you know diagnosis in terms of when you have these qcas when you have these qfrs coming up uh and and it it's now about image analysis and image analysis uh in future will will predict the diagnostic coronary angiogram with much better accuracy than human eye the problem with coronary angiogram as compared to ct and the x ray is that these are moving images so maybe for moving images it's much more difficult to to upload an analysis image but probably in real images ai would certainly smart humans in predicting the thank you sir any question if there is no question then i close this section and invite you dr bikas agarwal sir to talk on the rhythm disorder in the pregnancy and how to approach it first of all i would like to thank dr alok for inviting me and congratulations for him to him for uh, getting his this heart india conclave for continuous so many years so successfully so since morning we have been bombarded by coronary artery disease and heart failure and this topic is going to be a bit different uh, and uh, so what i'll be talking about is rhythm disorders in pregnancy and how to approach and uh, a very important uh, condition and a lot of times very neglected one so just going to uh, sh uh, to show a few slides about how to approach a case and uh, how how to manage pregnancy with rhythm disorders as we all know cardiovascular disease in pregnancy uh, it's not very uncommon 4% of all pregnancies are complicated with cardiovascular disease and uh, it 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 forms around 26% of all maternal deaths are related to cardiovascular causes data from india shows around 0.7 to 1.2% incidence of cardiac disease in india uh, in pregnancy and around 70 to 90% is rheumatic heart disease and a substantial maternal mortality, uh, mortality is associated with arrhythmias during pregnancy so it's an important case of managing it properly in pregnancy uh, there are some important changes in pregnancy one of the important changes is pregnancy is that there is a significant increase in heart rate uh, in pregnancy and uh, 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 average heart rate of around 80 in the pregnancy there is around a 20 to 25 percent increase in the heart rate uh, that goes on increasing from the first trimester to the second trimester to the third trimester and uh, this is associated with decrease in systemic vascular resistance and increase in cardiac output and all of this correlates with increase in plasma volume which is increased from first trimester to second trimester and third trimester and once they, you talk about tachycardia in pregnancy uh, somebody having excessive tachycardia in pregnancy 
यू शुड ऑलवेज कंसिडर अबाउट एनीमिया थायरोटॉक्सिकोसिस मे बी कार्डियमापैथी और इन वेरी इन इन सम केसेज इन अप्रोप्रिएट साइनस टेकी कार्डिया मे बी रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर एक्सेसिव टेकी कार्डिया एंड प्रेगनेंसी बट कीपिंग इन माइंड दैट अराउंड ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी फाइव परसेंट इंक्रीज इन हार्ट रेट इज एसोशिएटेड विद प्रेगनेंसी देर इज अ लॉट ऑफ टॉक अबाउट ई सी जी चेंजेज एंड मैकेनिजम्स ऑफ एरिदमियाज इन प्रेगनेंसी एंड प्रेगनेंसी डज कन्फर सम काइंड ऑफ ए यू नो सबस्ट्रेट फॉर इंक्रीज इज एरिदमियाज एंड दिस द मैकेनिज्म दैट हैव बिन पॉस्टुलेटेड आर हेमोडाइनमिक माई कार्डियल स्ट्रेच कुछ भी वन इंक्रीज हार्ट रेट एंड डिक्रीज हार्ट रेट वेरिएबिलिटी दैन हारमोनल चेंजेज इज इंक्रीज देर इज इंक्रीज इन माई कार्डियल एल्फा एडर्नर्जिक रिसेप्टर्स ड्यू टू एस्ट्रोजन एंड दिस इंक्रीजेज द ऑटोमेटिसिटी एंड ट्रिगर्ड एक्टिविटी विच कुड भी रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर प्रोपोगेशन प्रोपोगेशन ऑफ अरिदमियाज दैन ऑटोनोमिक चेंजेस इंक्रीजिंग इन रेस्टिंग हार्ट रेट चेंजेस इन रिफ्रैक्ट्री पीरियड्स दीज ऑल्सो कैन प्रमोट अरिदमिया सो मल्टीफैक्टोरियल Uh, factors sh- could be associated with increase in arrhythmias in pregnancy and then you talk about ecg changes in pregnancy this could be due to the increase in the uterus size that shifts the heart to the left and that could lead to qrs axis changes dynamic q waves in lead 3 that could be settled on de- deep inspiration then the increase in rs ratio pr and qt shortening and sinus tachycardia so these are normal physiological changes in ecg that uh, could be encountered during pregnancy coming to the individual arrhythmias ectopics are very common in pregnancy at atrial or ventricular ectopics are common and they increase in pregnancy they may appear for the first time in pregnancy and we get a lot of references uh, uh, cardiac uh, cardiology references for ectopics and they cause a huge anxiety to the patient and the patient's attendants and most of the times it's reassurance that is required because these are not something uh, that needs to be uh, managed and medication is rarely required for the for uh, uh, for the symptoms of ectopics supraventricular tachycardia whether it is avnrt or avrt are most common uh, arrhythmias during pregnancy atrial tachycardia is less common and rarely the initial onset of svt during pregnancy is around less than is less than 10% so but exacerbation is more common of pre existing arrhythmias which is around 20 to 50% with somebody having a history of supraventricular tachycardias and generally they present during the se- second and third trimester so a pregnant lady in the second and third trimester may present with a supraventricular tachycardia with a previous history of supraventricular uh, tachycardia and it is common in patients with structural heart disease especially congenital heart disease uh, how do you manage supraventricular tachycardia contrive vagal maneuvers for acute termination of these tachycardias or adenosine is one of the drugs that has found to be very safe in pregnancy so the drug of choice for acute termination would be adenosine then for maintenance of sinus rhythm and to prevent relapses first line would be a beta blocker with a with or without digoxin in the absence of pre excitation and the second line agent would be calcium channel blocker especially verapamil if pre excitation on the ecg is present then you cannot give digoxin uh and the drug of choice here is flecainide plus beta blocker because it can aggravate atrial fibrillation over the accessory pathway and lead to ventricular fibrillation then uh, ablation and uh, these are things that can be done in pregnancy and have been shown in case reports that it is a it, it is something that can be done but it, it is only done if the arrhythmia is refractory and people have tried minimal or zero fluoroscopy uh, ablation in in patients with uh, uh, with recurrent uh, uh, psvt adenosine just to mention about that it has a very short half life it has no known placental transfer no known teratogenicity efficacy similar to non gravid state you may require maybe higher doses but start with 6 to 12 mg and maybe up to 24 mg iv bolus may be required to terminate supraventricular tachycardia and generally fetal monitoring is not required once you are giving adenosine to these pregnant uh, ladies and it's supposed to terminate most of the supraventricular tachycardia and, and is also found to be a very safe drug for uh, acute termination there are some pharmacokinetic and dynamic changes in pregnancy there is increase in volume expansion increase renal perfusion decrease serum protein concent- uh, concentration so these pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic changes have to be kept in mind once you are uh, managing these patients with different drugs and managing for different arrhythmias atrial fibrillation in pregnancy it's one of the most common arrhythmias and 
it's also associated with increased mortality and tied to underlying structural heart disease. If the patient is hemodynamic stable, initial management is generally rate control in these patients. Uh, most of the patients in our setup are rheumatic heart disease patients with mitral stenosis. So rate control is the mechanism how you manage these patients. So acute and chronic first line therapy is beta blockers plus or minus digoxin. Second line would be a calcium channel blocker, especially verapamil is one of the drugs that can be considered. Somebody who has a hemodynamically unstable AF, DC cardioversion can be done if needed. Then the other antiarrhythmic drugs to prevent recurrences of atrial fibrillation where you want to maintain a sinus rhythm in patients, fleconide and sotalol have been found to be safe choices in these drugs. Uh, then uh, ablation again like supraventricular tachycardia is generally not required, you are able to control most of the times. Anticoagulation in pregnancy, low molecular weight heparin is preferred and for this is important that a pre-excited uh, atrial fibrillation, somebody having a WPW syndrome, here you require DC cardioversion because this is where you have to act immediately and this, case, this could lead to ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest. So here DC cardioversion is important. Cardioversion in pregnancy, it is, a, uh, it is a safe procedure and can be performed safely in, even in pregnant ladies. Uh, the things that you have to keep keep in mind once you're doing cardioversion in pregnancy is avoid breast tissue with pad placement. Fetal outcome is tied with mechanical, uh, ma maternal hemodynamics and it's not cardioversion per se that causes fetal uh, outcome, uh, 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 adverse fetal outcomes. Uterus acts as a insulator. Low energy can be used if supraventricular tachycardia is uh, present. Supine position positioning time should be minimized so that there's less compression over the, and uh, that can hamper the hemodynamics so try to minimize the supine positioning and anticoagulation is recommended even if the AF lasts for less than 48 hours so anticoagulation is important once you are doing cardioversion. Regarding oral anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation during pregnancy and this is an important thing pregnancy as we all know is a prothrombotic state generally we follow the chad vas score for managing atrial fibrillation anticoagulation but this has not been tried in pregnancy and there, there is no data to suggest that we can, we should use Chadwell score. Low dose of warfarin, if it is less than five milligram per day, generally causes very low risk of embryogenesis and underlying structural heart disease uh, generally warrants a full oral anticoagulation. NOACs are prohibited in pregnancy, so you cannot pre prescribe NOAC. In the first six to 12 weeks, generally low molecular weight heparin is considered, but warfarin even in low doses can be given in, low, uh, in the first trimester. If it is the dose is less than five milligram per day, warfarin uh, can be given because it has been shown that lower doses of warfarin does not cause very much, uh, is, has very low risk of embryogenesis abnormalities. More than five milligram per day can be given in second trimester and it is a class two recommendation according to the ESC guidelines. And prior to delivery, you have to admit these patients and convert them into low molecular weight heparin because warfarin has shown to increase intracerebral, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage and all these problems. So you have to start th in the th uh, prior to delivery low molecular weight heparin. Low dose aspirin can be given in all pre uh, patients and is uh, found safe throughout pregnancy. Ventricular tachycardia and uh, may increase in frequency in, preg uh, in pregnancy may appear for the first time. And somebody who has a structural heart, uh, without a structural heart disease, somebody having idiopathic ventricular tachycardia, uh, which is hemodynamically stable, generally is associated with a good, good prognosis. And the drugs of choice here are beta blockers, but beta blockers should be continued throughout the pregnancy and postpartum period also, because these patients are liable to get recurrent episodes of uh, ventricular tachycardia. Other drugs that can be considered are virapamil, fliconide, sotalol, uh, which may be considered in these patients of ventricular tachycardia tachycardia to convert them from ventricular tachycardia to sinus rhythm. Then polymorphic VT generally associated with structural cardiac conduct conditions or underlying channelopathies and cardiomyopathies of pregnancy or spontaneous coronary artery dissection is one are, one are the conditions where you can find polymorphic VT and VF. And uh, resuscitation and defibrillation are important steps to if they are uh, if, if if the VT uh, leads to hemodynamic inst instability and the drugs that can be given to convert them to sinus rhythm are lidocaine is 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 the number one drug and beta blockers can also be used and somebody who is not responding to lidocaine proconamide or quinidine may be used if 
lidocaine is not uh, effective. Long QT syndrome, uh, patients with channelopathies, long QT syndrome, again can have more episodes of torsades or uh, arrhythmias during pregnancy and the beta blocker that is preferred in these patients is propanolol and uh, generally it's important to uh, understand that you have to avoid drugs that can lead to increase in QT interval even in, in, in the pre uh, pregnancy uh, period or just after delivery and anti emetic use is one of the drugs that is very, very commonly used. These drugs can also prolong the QT interval. So the drug list should be there so that you don't prescribe drugs that can again increase the QT interval in these patients. Generally, patients with long QT syndrome have a pregnancy that is usually uncomplicated and the most important uh, peak incidence of events in these patients is the postpartum period or just postpartum and uh, so this is where this is the time when you should be careful uh, once you are dealing with pregnant female uh, females with long QT syndrome Brugada syndrome again important here is that you should avoid uh, uh, precursors that lead to in, uh, increase in torsades or increase in uh, ventricular fibrillation in these patients and it's important to treat fevers and avoid dehydration because these are the main triggers in these pregnant ladies that can lead to uh, torsades. Uh, avoidance of medication on drugs to avoid list and then it uh, data has shown that generally Brugada syndrome does not uh, did not uh, uh, affect pregnancy uh, in, in, in a way that it, 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 it brings about uh, different changes. So uh, in one study with 104 women, there were no events that were seen during pregnancy. So again, the pregnancy is usually favorable in, in Brugada syndrome. Then catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, uh, here the beta blockers have to be continued throughout pregnancy and pregnancy is generally uh, uncomplicated. And the only time that these patients can develop bidirectional VT is an intrapartum stress that may trigger uh, bidirectional VT and VF. And generally it can be taken care of by good sedation and analgesia or you could require IV beta blocker that is esmolol. Congenital complete heart block, uh, ladies with com congenital complete, complete heart block generally tolerate pregnancy quite uh, well uh, and uh, generally asymptomatic patients can usually raise their heart rate under stress and heart rate can be increased with isoprenaline and pacemaker implantation is rarely needed uh, in, in, in pregnant ladies with congenital complete heart block. Then we find, then may, we may find patients with pacemakers and ICDs and how do you uh, manage these patients uh, or pregnant ladies with pacemakers and ID, ICDs and generally it has been seen that they do not increase fetal or maternal risk and uh, generally what we require in these pacemakers is heart rate can be augmented to achieve the physiological 10 to 15 percent increase and uh, if you require pacemaker implantation during pregnancy then a fluoroscopic free pacemaker implant can be done even under echocardiographic gui guidance and electroanatomic mapping uh, reprogramming of the pacemaker to an asynchromous mode during cesarean delivery and using bipolar cautery in pacemaker dependent patients is important to avoid pacing inhibition caused by noise, noise in interference and icds have also been found to be safe during pregnancy Fe fetal fibrillation threshold is high and uh, the only problem is during diathermy or during labor or during delivery uh, icds may oversense and lead to shock so what you can do is switch off the shocking uh, part of the ICD or put in a magnet over the device and, uh, and then re-switch uh, re after delivery. So these are the different drugs. We have already talked about uh, the drugs and uh, this is uh, the drugs that have shown to be very safe during pregnancy are adenosine, digoxin, lidocaine and sotalol. Beta blockers are on a whole uh, safe but atenolol is not advised. Propanolol, metoprolol, uh, labetalol are found to be moderately safe and have been found to be uh, can be used during pregnancy. Atenolol uh, is not the drug of choice uh, and it has been shown to cause in, intra, uh, intrauterine growth retardation and different uh, um, uh, problems in, inside the fetus so the uh, beta blocker of choice would be propanolol. Then the drugs that are not advised during pregnancy are amidorone, dronadorone, dofiletide, uh, evabredine. So these should be avoided during pregnancy and amidorone should only be used when all the drugs fail and you uh, require something to, uh, there is uh, there's not sufficient data with carvedilol that is available. And looking at 
the importance of this topic it is going to be a consensus statement on the management of arrhythmias during pregnancy and this is the heart rhythm society that is going to publish it it was supp supposed to come up in 2021 but it was uh, because of the covid times it's now supposed to come up in 2022 so we are waiting for this consensus statement of management of arrhythmias during pregnancy thank you Because this topic is uh, very important and uh, many of the physician clinician faces this uh, situation many of the times in pregnancy. So uh, again, very thank you. And this session is open for the question answer. Please, any uh, question? Wanted to because we have encountered such situations. Uh, there is a primary gravita who is uh, having mild to moderate MS, and in the first very first trimester she has developed atrial fibrillation. So would, it, would you plan for elective BMB uh, or will it be better to wait for the worsening of her dyspnea and as well as AF and at that time should we go for BMB? Uh, actually, BMB will depend upon her mitral valve area and her symptoms. If she is symptomatic and uh, if she can be managed in, in the second trimester because that is the time when the BMV can be done uh, around around 18 to 20 weeks. When when is the time to do the BMV? I think uh, if the patient is symptomatic and you think that the pregnancy cannot con because patients of mitral stenosis, severe mitral stenosis, generally become symptomatic during delivery or just after delivery. Then when there is a lot of auto transfusion that happens, so you have to manage that part and think whether the patient requires BMV and if if the patient requires BMV you have to intervene at 18, 18 to 22 weeks. Regarding atrial fibrillation part, atrial fibrillation is generally associated with mitral stenosis and generally rate control in this patient if the patient is not very symptomatic with a beta blocker or verapamil is the, are the drugs of charge which can be safely given in pregnancy. So you can continue the patient on beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, uh, in a beta blocker or a verapamil and monitor the patient or even digoxin. These patients can even be given digoxin. And if you, f if you think that the patient is symptomatic, will not be able to tolerate pregnancy then around 18 to 20 weeks you can advise her the BMV. But generally atrial fibrillation in these patients of mitral, uh, mitral stenosis does not, uh, does not recover after even BMV because of the changes in the LA that happens. So maybe you will have to continue beta blockers beta block. even, after, even after doing a BMV in these yeah. patients. Thank you very much sir. And just because of your nice presentation and out of interest, uh, I'm asking, uh, I want to ask one more question that I faced myself. We got a reference from neonatology. Uh, ma SLE mother, mother with this SLE, she delivered a baby. Actually, this is out of the scope of this oh, okay. talk, but the baby had a congenital heart block. Okay, uh, so he had a heart block and we are unable to do anything for him. Ultimately, we had to refer him somewhere. I don't know what is the outcome, but could we have done something uh, for that case? Uh, congenital complete heart block in a fetus, actually. Yeah. Uh, there's not much you can do. Uh, I think only two drugs have been tried. One is immunosuppressive agents, especially steroids, which have been shown to have modest benefit to increase the heart rate. Second that has been tried is chloroquine. Uh, but I don't think we have much to offer these patients. Generally, after delivery, they have to undergo a permanent pacemaker transplantation. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, one more question from, from my side. If, the, if a la pregnant lady has a BT with hemodynamically unstable, then sir, what will be the treatment of choice in that condition if the pregnant lady is in first time at a second and third? Uh, if it is hemodynamically unstable, you have to cardiovert. DC cardioversion is the choice and DC cardioversion has been shown to be safe. So you cannot wait because hemodynamic unstability is the one that causes fetal fetal abnormality. So you have to make the hemodynamics stable as early as possible and it's it's an emergency. So you have to give DC cardioversion and then put her on a drug to uh, avoid further uh, recurrences. The drug of choice for somebody who is hemodynamically stable is lidocaine. I think lidocaine is the one that has been studied most in pregnancy and can be given safely. Uh. Yeah, even a modern you can use. Any, any, any toxicity comes when you use a certain amount of drug for a longer period of time. Yeah. In emergency situation, DC cardioversion is best. 
and lignocaine in if lignocaine is not working then you can go for uh, amidron as well because uh, bt itself is a life threatening thing mm. so in that situation you have you should not wait for uh, drug side effect and once it is stabilized for prevention instead of using amidron you you should use beta blocker uh, for pre preventing the recurrence yeah. so preventing recurrence you should do beta, beta blocker amidron in short doses in yeah. short intervals has shown to cause no I toxicity to the because beta. our aim is to control the bt otherwise it, you will lose the patient mm. Mm. thank you sir if any question then close this session thank you uh, thank you dr vikas agarwal sir for this uh, brief and uh, descriptive talk on uh, rhythm disorders in pregnancy last but not the least uh, i would like to call upon the uh, stage uh, dr dharmin jain sir to present his uh, topic on perioperative cardiac risk assessment in patients undergoing non cardiac surgery so over to you sir would like to thank and congratulate uh, dr alok and uh, i have been given a message to wind up early because uh, i am between the dinner and uh, uh, the uh, one more interesting uh, i think ecg workshop he want to conduct uh, so that will be more beneficial than this uh, i think uh, this is very important topic actually uh, perioperative cardiac risk assessment in patient undergoing non cardiac surgery so we have got a recent uh, esc 2022 guideline in august so i will highlight some few points from these guidelines 2022 esc guidelines so the total risk is an interaction of uh, uh, patient related uh, and surgery related risk so if the patient related risk is low and surgery related risk is low then only attention is required and if it is high both risk are high we, uh, we can consider for postponing or avoiding this uh, uh, non cardiac surgery so in between there is increased attention or high attention is required so these are the various list of surgeries uh, according to surgical risk Le uh, low means less than 1 intermediate 1 to 5% and high surgical more than 5% risk so these are the low surgical risk breast dental endocrine eye gynecological minor orthopedic minor like meniscectomy reconstructive superficial surgery minor urological surgery like turp and these are the high risk uh, like adrenal resection aortic or major vascular surgery carotid uh, artery um, stenting duodenal pancreatic surgery liver resection esophagectomy open lower limb revascularization pneumectomy pulmonary liver transplants repair of perforated bowel or total cystectomy so uh, in between there are intermediate surgical risk and uh, uh, they say that uh, there is two a recommendation for endovascular or bdo assisted procedure in patients with high cv risk undergoing vascular or pulmonary surgery so we should go endovascular there is a, a pre operative assessment before non cardiac surgery so we can do ecg or biomarkers if they are intermediate or high risk uh, non cardiac surgery otherwise no none none test are required and uh, in all patient schedule for ncs an accurate history and clinical examination is very important so history and clinical examination before giving the fitness for non cardiac surgery and uh, perform pre operative risk assessment ideally at the same time when ncs is proposed if time allows it is recommended to optimize guideline recommended treatment for cardiovascular disease and risk factors before non cardiac surgery so all the treatment should be optimized before non cardiac surgery in patient with uh, uh, genetic cardiomyopathy we can do ecg and eco before surgery regardless of age and symptom if the patient is 45 or 65 year of age without sign symptoms then uh, ecg and biomarker should be considered in a newly detected murmur and symptom sign Uh, or the uh, patient is having newly detected murmur suggesting clinical significant uh, pathology or patient without other signs but uh, it is uh, mm, uh, moderate and high risk uh, non cardiac surgery we can do the uh, echo for before non cardiac surgery so indication for echo is there uh, and uh, previous unknown uh, unknown angina but patient is coming with the non cardiac surgery and having the chest pain along with that new onset or other symptoms suggestive of cad then uh, further diagnostic workup is uh, to be done before non cardiac surgery and if the patient is having acute non cardiac surgery and acute chest pain or other symptoms 
of undetected CAD, then multidisciplinary assessment, uh, and then decide regarding the further going for the bef CAG before, or you want to do the surgery. So uh, multidisciplinary approach is recommended. If the patient is having dyspnea or peripheral edema, we should do the ECG and NT pro BNP. And if NT pro BNP is raised, then do the echo also, transthoracic echo. And if the patient is uh, having a, uh, what we should do in uh, all patients, we should give individualized instructions for pre-op and post-op change in the medication. When we will change the medication, it should be given in a verbal and written format and clear and concise information to the patient. It should be considered to set up a structured, informed list for the patient with CBD or at high risk. So we can make a checklist also uh, like this. And uh, uh, we can uh, also have a risk score calculators. Uh, so revised cardiac risk index or surgical risk calculators. So various risk scores are available uh, for deciding the cardiac risk. Recommendations for uh, frail patients, we, more than 70 years, we should do the frailty screening or the patient is uh, um, adjusting the risk assessment according to self-reported ability to climb two flights of stairs should be considered in patient referred for intermediate or high risk. So two flights of stairs, if they, he can not go, then uh, that should be assessed accordingly. And uh, uh, recommended measurement to assess and detect the post-op cardiac complications. So we should do ECG, ECG and uh, uh, high sensitivity cardiac troponin before uh, non-cardiac surgery and uh, after non-cardiac surgery, uh, 24 hour after or 48 hour after non-cardiac surgery. If the pre-op uh, troponin is not available, we can do at one or two days, difference of one or two days. And if, the, if, if it is more than the baseline, then uh, it is the perioperative myocardial infarction. Uh, myocardial injury is there, so we should identify the cause and treat, do the ECG, ECO and clinical assessment and treat it accordingly. In patient uh, who have a known CBD or uh, CB risk factors and including age more than 65 years, symptom of signs of CBD, ECG should be done uh, before surgery and uh, uh, troponin I should be done or BNP or uh, anti pro BNP should be done. And uh, in low risk patients undergoing uh, low intermediate risk NCS, it is not recommended to do ECG, trop I or BNP, nothing is required. And uh, echo is recommended uh, in patient with poor functional capacity or uh, high troponin uh, uh, anti-pro BNP. And echo is also required required in suspected new cardiovascular disease with uh, uh, unexplained sign of symptoms or poor functional cap capacity with abnormal ECG or anti-pro BNP or more than one clinical risk factor before intermediate surgery. And uh, uh, to avoid delaying in surgery, focus exam can also be done to uh, avoid the transthoracic as an alternative to transthoracic echo. And routine pre-op uh, LV function is not recommended in all the cases. Stress imaging is recommended uh, before high-risk uh, NCS uh, in patient with poor functional capacity and high likelihood of CAD or prior PCI or CVG or the patient is having clinical risk factors. Otherwise, stress imaging routinely is not recommended before NCS. It is uh, uh, coronary angiography, so regarding this, uh, uh, the recommended to use the same indication for angiography and revascularization pre-op as in the non-surgical setting. So if the patient is having indication for angiography, even bef uh, without any indication for surgery, and the similar guidelines applies to the non-cardiac surgery. And uh, CCTA can also help in ruling out CAD in patient with suspected CCS or biomarker negative non-ST elevation uh, ACS in case of low to intermediate clinical likelihood of CAD or not suitable for non-visive functional testing undergoing non-urgent intermediate high risk NCS. Preoperative angio may also be considered in stable uh, CCS patients undergoing elective surgical carotid endarterotomy. And routinely preoperative uh, angiography is not recommended in stable CCS patients undergoing lower intermediate risk surgeries. Smoking cessation more than four weeks before non-cardiac surgery is recommended. And uh, uh, control of severe factor including BP, dyslipidemia, diabetes is recommended before NCS. It is class one recommendation. In patient uh, uh, with indication for statins, it should be considered to initiate perioperatively. If the patient is having clinical risk factors, we can start the beta blockers. If the patient is having uh, uh, preoperative beta blocker in advance to NCS may be considered in patient with known CAD or myocardial ischemia, but routine initiation of beta blocker perioperatively is not recommended. 
perioperative beta blocker if a patient already taking beta blocker or statin it should be continued and a stable heart failure ras inhibitors may also be uh, considered but without heart failure ras inhibitors uh, on the day of ncs should be stopped diuretic should be stopped in, if in hypertensive patient and sglt2 inhibitors should be stopped at least 3 days before these are the various uh, antiplatelets pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics so we can see here the uh, uh, the half life the duration of action after last dose is 7 to 10 days for aspirin 3 to 10 days for clopidogrel 7 to 10 days for prasugrel 3 to 5 days for ticagrel these are all having a, a, a in days then congrelor is the new agent which is having 1 to 2 hours only action after stopping it eptifibatite for 4 hours and tyrofeban for 8 hours so uh, uh, the bleeding risk according to type of non cardiac surgery so surgery with minor bleeding low bleeding or high bleeding be divided into three groups and uh, cataract glaucoma dental procedures endoscopy superficial surgery these, these are minor bleeding risk while uh, high bleeding risk are abdominal surgery with liver biopsy cancer surgery neuro surgery major orthopedic surgeries vascular organ biopsy reconstructive plastic surgery such so specific inter interventions like uh, colon lumbar puncture thoracic surgery urological surgery bladder tumor vascular surgery so these all comes with the high bleeding risk so we divide accordingly and then decide regarding the continuation of the antiplatelet accordingly so if it is high bleeding risk then uh, then we have to stop uh, interrupt the this uh, antiplatelet p2y12 inhibitor ticagrelor 3 to 5 days before clopidogrel 5 days before prasugrel 7 days before and uh, uh, um, if the patient is having a high thrombotic risk then uh, we can bridge with the uh, gp2v3 inhibitor or congrelor so this is very new therapy which we can consider which is available uh, now in india congrelor can be used to bridge the therapy in a high thrombotic like pci less than 1 month old or acs less than 3 month old or high risk for stent thrombosis procedure these patients should be given the bridge therapy if if the patient is having p2y12 uh, uh, and if the patient is having acs uh, at the index pci acs patient they should be deferred the non cardiac surgery at least 6 month if the patient is having uh, not having acs then uh, uh, then we can if the patient is having acs we should defer it to one year and if it is not non acs then defer it to six years at least the non cardiac surgeries which is elective so similar thing is shown here and uh, we can uh, give the bridging iv antiplatelet as i told tyrofeban eptifibatide three days before and uh, then we do the surgery and uh, stop the medication accordingly accordingly prasugrel 7 days before clopidogrel ticagrelor 5 days before and start the infusion 3 days before and then restart the clopidogrel with loading dose or we can restart the uh, this gp2v similarly congrelor can also be started 3 days before and stop the antiplatelet 7 days prasugrel and 3 5 days clopidogrel ticagrelor and then do the surgery uh, after 3 days of congrelor and then restart the congrelor or give the clopidogrel loading with uh, followed by od dose so uh, it is recommended to delay the elective ncs until 6 month after elective pci and 12 month after acs respectively and uh, after elective pci it is recommended uh, for one month of dapt at least should be given in a patient, recent uh, uh, pci for scheduled uh, for ncs it is recommended to manage antiplatelet between the surgeon anesthesia and cardiologist it should be discussed and decided regarding this strategy in a high risk patient with recent pci at least 3 month duration should be given in a time sensitive ncs we can wait for the non cardiac surgery at least 3 months should we should wait and uh, uh, in patient with prior pci it is recommended to continue aspirin perioperatively if the bleeding risk allows so uh, we should insist the surgeon that if bleeding risk allows if it is minor bleeding risk we should continue the aspirin at least and uh, uh, recommended time interval for drug interruption so mm, the ticagrelor for 3 to 5 days clopidogrel for 5 days and prasugrel for 7 days and then uh, uh, in patient going for high bleeding risk surgery like uh, neuro surgery then we should interrupt the aspirin at least 7 days if we are interrupting it it should be stopped 7 days prior aspirin in patient with the history of pci interruption of aspirin and at least 3 days before ncs may be considered if the bleeding risk outweighs the ischemic risk to reduce the risk of bleeding 
if antiplatelet is has been interrupted before surgical procedure it's recommended to restart as soon as possible within 48 hour we should start the antiplatelet according to interdisciplinary risk assessment so or, regarding oral anticoagulation the, they say that bridging uh, if if the patient is having uh, not having the high bleeding risk then uh, we can continue with the vk and uh, with low level of inr or short interruption or uh, we can uh, interrupt the noex short interruption but uh, bridging is not required if the patient is not having high bleeding risk we can continue the medications uh, one day before and then uh, it with lower dose of vk um, or the short interruption of this uh, no x without bridging but if it is patient is having high thrombotic risk like uh, mechanical valve or uh, very high thromboembolic risk then we can think of bridging therapy uh, so class 2a and class 2b recommendations are there and uh, uh, for bridging uh, uh, perioperative uh, no x uh, according to peri procedural risk of bleeding so if it is minor bleeding risk uh, we can skip the evening dose of uh, dabigatran and epixaban and we can restart mo uh, more than 6 hour after surgery if minor bleeding risk if low bleeding risk we should st stop the no x one day before and consider uh, in the evening to restart it post surgery if high bleeding risk then two days before we should stop the no x and uh, uh, then after uh, one day we can think restart of noex 48 to 72 hours after and uh, uh, timing of uh, dose in renal dysfunction uh, so renal in renal dysfunction in dabigatran uh, we should stop it uh, more than for 24 hour before if lower uh, low and high bleeding risk accordingly low bleeding risk uh, more than 24 hours high bleeding risk more than 48 hour gap is required and uh, epixaban rivaroxaban more than 24 hour in low risk and more than 48 hour for high risk if the uh, renal dysfunction is more than more uh, uh, more before um, three days two to three days before we have to stop the um, uh, no x then uh, suggested is for potential reversal of non vitamin k so uh, if the patient is having uh, requirement of immediate uh, surgery then then we can check for the blood uh, coagulation test and uh, if the noex are more than 12 hours before taken then uh, we can do the uh, non cardiac surgery if it is taken within 12 hours then we can see the surgery related risk and uh, availability of uh, agents for reversal and then accordingly we should recheck the coagulation level and uh, uh, accordingly we should manage and uh, if it is more than 12 hours last dose of noex we can perform the non cardiac surgery when urgent surgical intervention is required it is recommended for noex therapy to immediately interrupt it we should stop noex uh, and uh, this is the uh, specific antidote for ida rucizumab for dabigatran and uh, uh, it should be considered if the patient require urgent surgical intervention with intermediate to high bleeding risk non cardiac surgery in non minor bleeding risk procedures patient using noex noex should be interrupted according to renal function and bleeding risk and uh, if the patient is having uh, very high risk of bleeding interventions like knee, spinal or neurosurgery then uh, interruption of noex for up to five half lives and then reinitiate after 24 hours if the pa patient is going for a spinal or epidural anesthesia interruption of anticoagulation when a specific reversal agent are not there then we can use pcc or activated platelet concentrate which should be considered for reversing the noex effects so these are available if uh, the antidote is not there if urgent surgical intervention is required a specific coagulation test should be done and noex plasma labels also should, are, also should be tested in minor bleeding risk surgery we can perform surgery without interruption and low molecular weight heparin is uh, in, uh, may be recommended for bridging the patient in high surgical risk and in patient using noex it is recommended that minor bleeding risk procedures are performed at trough levels it means 12 to 24 hours after the last intake of noex we can do the minor uh, bleeding risk procedures for patients uh, with mechanical prosthetic valves undergoing ncs bridging with uh, unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin should be considered and similarly bridging is not recommended in patient with low or moderate thrombotic risk so only the prosthetic heart valves mechanical avr old generation mechanical avr mechanical mitral or tricuspid valve replacement these are the indication for the bridging therapy and uh, if bleeding risk uh, uh, with resumption of full dose anticoagulation outweighs the risk of thromboembolic events postpone the therapeutic anticoagulation 40 to 72 hours after the procedure 
using post-op thromboprophylaxis until resumption of full oral anticoagulant dose is deemed safe. So we should resume it accordingly. 48 to 72 hour bridge with the heparin and restart the oral anticoagulation accordingly and use of reduced dose NOAC is not uh, recommended and uh, for thromboprophylaxis it is recommended that decision about perioperative thromboprophylaxis in ACS, NCS are based on individual and procedure specific risk factors and uh, uh, in patient with low bleeding risk perioperative thromboprophylaxis should be considered for 14 days in total knee arthroplasty and 35 days uh, for uh, hip arthroplasty. So acute and chronic coronary syndrome so in this uh, uh, we, we should in the ACS uh, optimized guideline recommended medical therapy uh, in the patient uh, management of patient with ACS and CCS scheduled for non-cardiac surgery so if the patient is having ACS then optimized guideline recommended medical therapy diagnostic workup therapeutic pathways according to ACS guidelines should be done and then angiography with uh, IFR, FFR should be done and treated accordingly. If the patient having chronic stable angina, then uh, chronic coronary syndrome, then optimize the guideline directed therapy. And uh, we can do clinical examination, ECG, biomarkers before uh, in intermediate risk. And we can do the functional capacity test also. And uh, similarly in high risk also, the, we can do the similar things, uh, ECG, biomarkers, clinical examination, eco and stress imaging. Recommendations for timing of non-cardiac surgery and revascularization. So uh, in, if the PCI is indicated before NCS, the use of new generation DES recommended. Previously we were telling that BMS should be given, but now new generation DES are recommended in PCI before NCS. Pre-operative evaluation of patient with indication of PCI by expert team should be done. And uh, myocardial re revascularization before high risk NCS may be considered and routine revascularization before low or intermediate risk is not required. If NCS can be safely be postponed uh, at least three months, it is recommended that uh, ACS being scheduled for NCS undergo diagnostic therapeutic interventions as per ACS guidelines. So uh, for patient with heart failure, we should do the ECO and NT pro BNP and uh, uh, the patient should receive optimal medical therapy for heart failure and we should assess the volume status and signs of organ perfusion in heart failure patients. The patient with severe aortic valve stenosis, uh, so if the intermediate or high risk NCS, then uh, if it is, uh, if the patient is having risk for valve procedure low, then we should do the TABI or SAVR accordingly in a patient of severe AS, which is going for intermediate or high risk NCS. And we can consider BAB before NCS if uh, feasible if the patient is high risk for valve procedure. If we cannot do TAVR or uh, SEVR, then we should do the at least BAB in severe AS patients. Similarly, if the patient is having lower or intermediate risk and uh, um, LV dysfunction is uh, there, EF less than 50%, then uh, if the patient is having high risk non-cardiac surgery, similar things can be fo followed that TABI or SEVR can be given and BAB can be given if the TABI or SEVR cannot be done. So management of secondary MR also we can uh, we can do uh, this uh, age to age repair or surgery in intermediate risk or high risk NCS for secondary MR and uh, uh, if, if it is not feasible in operable patient then NCS can be done with a strict monitoring. So clinical and eco evaluation is recommended in all patients with non-suspected valvular heart disease who are scheduled for elective intermediate or high risk NCS. And uh, as I told, SEVR or TABI ca can be done in a symptomatic patients if the patient is having intermediate or high risk NCS. And is in severe AR also, and uh, if the uh, patient is having uh, LVESD more than 50 or <coughs> LVESDI more than 25 or EF less than 50, then valve surgery is recommended for uh, intermediate to high risk non-cardiac surgeries. In mitral stenosis also, if the patient is having moderate to severe mitral stenosis, then valve intervention is recommended like PTMC or uh, MBR is recommended before elective intermediate or high risk NCS. So patient with severe MS, severe AS, severe MR, severe secondary MR and severe AR, they should be treated first if high risk, uh, intermediate or high risk surgeries are there. And similarly, for the severe primary AR also, we should do the surgical or transcatheter intervention 
prior to intermediate high risk surgeries and uh, uh, in patient with severe sec secondary mr also who remain symptomatic despite gdmt and crt then transcatheter uh, we can do the mitra clip or surgical repair uh, regarding arrhythmias also we should uh, give the anti arrhythmic drug continued and uh, in symptomatic patient with recurrent persistent svt so ablation can also be considered and uh, if the af is there with hemodynamic instability then elective uh, emergency ele electrical cardioversion can be done and uh, amidron may be considered for acute control of heart rate in af with hemodynamic instability ventricular arrhythmias uh, so we should if the patient having symptomatic monomorphic sustained vt with myocardial scar and rec uh, recurring despite optimal medical therapy ablation is recommended before the elective ncs and uh, if it is asymptomatic vpcs no need of uh, treatment to initiate it perioperative arrhythmias we should assess with the ecg and te and uh, if the bt with the structural heart disease then angiography or ct mri can be done and uh, uh, treatment uh, standard treatment of sbt vagal maneuver ib adenosine beta blocker ccb or electrical cardioversion if unstable sbt is there and similar for the idiopathic vt similar treatment is there and uh, in vt underlying heart disease with ib beta blocker amidron electrical cardioversion if unstable and we can continue these medications beta blockers ccbs catheter ablation if uh, patient having recurrence despite omt here also uh, catheter ablation if the recurrence is there and uh, here also catheter ablation if recurrence is there and we can continue with the beta blocker and amidron in vt if indications for pacing is there then we can uh, do uh, the ncs surgery should be deferred and implantation of pacemaker should be given and uh, if it is recommended with patient with temporarily deactivated icds uh, have the continuous ecg monitoring and during perioperative period a person should be there who can do the early detection and treatment of arrhythmias in high risk patients uh, uh, pacemaker dependent or icd patients so uh, it is recommended to place transcutaneous pacing or defibrillation pads prior to non cardiac surgery and for uh, ventricular arrhythmias it is recommended that all patient with cid which are reprogrammed before surgery should have a recheck and necessary reprogramming as soon as possible so these are the site for the electrode of reference electrode for the electrocautery so when this is the site of surgery then electrocautery should be away from the site of ciid so it should be planned accordingly uh, the this reference pad should be as much away from the uh, the site of ciid and uh, in patient with adult uh, congenital heart disease we can divide into the small intermediate and severe risk and accordingly we should uh, in adult congenital heart disease patient the consultation with the specialist is recommended and uh, intermediate and high risk uh, elective surgery is performed in a center with experience with the adult congenital heart disease and in pericarditis also we can defer the elective ncs until complete treatment is there and in the patient with pulmonary arterial hypertension we can divide into the patients according to the ph related perioperative factor or surgery related perioperative factors and then accordingly we can start the continue the chronic therapy hemodynamic monitoring and we can see the progression of right heart failure and manage accordingly dobutamine milinone and levosimendone in ph patients can be used and uh, uh, pre operative management of hypertension should be done and uh, uh, then only we should perform the surgery it is not recommended to defer ncs in patient with stage 1 to hypertension so so this is central illustration complex interplay is there between the intrinsic risk surgery and patient with risk of peri operative cardiovascular complications so there is comorbidity risk thrombotic risk hypoxic risk and hemodynamic risk and uh, we have to assess all of them and accordingly we should divide into low intermediate and high surgical risk and we should manage the patient accordingly thank you thank you dr dharmen jain for this uh, wonderful presentation uh, so now the ha house is open for questions so do we have any questions
हाँ ठीक है समटाइम्स वी गेट रेफरेंस फ्रॉम सर्जरी पीपल दैट द पेशेंट वॉज नॉन हाइपरटेंसिव नॉन डायबिटिक एंड अ डे बिफोर सर्जरी ही डेवलप्ड अ पल्स रेट ऑफ हंड्रेड एट एंड अ ब्लड प्रेशर ऑफ हंड्रेड सेवेंटी बाई टेन हंड्रेड और लाइक दैट एंड नॉर्मली वी गिव बीटा ब्लॉकर्स अपार्ट फ्रॉम एमलोडिपीन और सो इज दैट आई मीन इज दैट ओके आई मीन पेरी ऑपरेटिवली इफ समन डेवलप स्टैकी कार्डिया विद हाइपर टेंशन should you uh, is that the good treatment for my mild to moderate hypertension we should not defer the surgery we can give the uh, anti hypertensive accordingly and continue with the surgery it is mild hypertension it may be related to anxiety only anxiolytic may work okay and uh, accordingly we can give some anti hypertensive but uh, we should avoid the hypotension in in a few surgeries Pretty so open. so that we should be Keep in mind before prescribing anti-hypertensive in such cases where the patient is not known uh, hypertensive. So we should avoid the hypertension rather. So we should be re uh, restrictive. We should, if it is related to anxiety, anti-anxiety should be tried and then reassess the BP in if required. Then really we can give and some anti-hypertensive. Even if the uh, pulse rate remains high, that that is nothing to bother. We can give the beta, beta blocker block. according to indications. Uh, okay. And sir, any role of artificial intelligence because sometimes the situations are so complex that patient is in sepsis and you have to do exploratory laparotomy, or he is in in impending sepsis, but there is no other way out except to do a laparotomy. Is there any role of apart from other factors, age and lot of things, any role of artificial intelligence in predicting uh, the risk? Risk predictors are there for uh, all the surgery. As you are told, telling this is the situation of high risk. non cardiac surgery and here we have to if it is urgent like sepsis is condition is there we cannot see we, nothing is recommended to see it's a urgent surgery and we can go ahead according to the guidelines which says that uh, thank you very much sir for uh, such a duty you have taken duty of such a elaborate talk But these are very <laughs> wonderful guidelines yeah. easily available online and uh, we can refer any time if confusion is there one quick question ravinder so in a post bypass case post cvg case comes to you uh, after one year of cvg his ventricular function is normal asymptomatic but he is going for a major major hepatic resection what single test you would like to recommend to give a complete fitness for surgery only single if you say single test we need uh, uh, as i already shown this uh, this uh, uh, is given in the ac guideline that we should assess at least troponin to document the myocardial injury so we should do the troponin Uh, before the surgery, uh, then 24 hour after surgery, then 48 hours uh, after surgery to document the myocardial injury induced by the um, non-cardiac surgery. So this is the test, and uh, we can do the other test like ECG and uh, echo, and uh, if required, stress test according to the clinical uh, symptoms of the patient. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, Dharmendra Jain sir. Now the session is for the Alok Kumar Singh sir. to conduct the ecg fuse the session was actually yeah. planned for a ecg quiz but uh, the resident were not keen to participate in quiz so they have asked for the workshop but uh, i will show the case and uh, i will discuss i will take opinion of you so the ecg approach to the common cardiac sy symptom and objective is to provide an overview of some important ecg patterns which we must be able to recognize in emergency whether you are going to become a cardiologist or not but you should know it and to outline the appropriate management of patients presenting with some of the more common ecg patterns when uh, i am giving some outline then i will uh, give the ecg some question need to be answered to uh, uh, in order to identify an unknown arrhythmias first is is the rate is slow or fast if it is slow then it's bradycardia if it is fast then it is tachycardia if it's slow it can be sinus bradycardia it can be sinus arrest it can be conduction blocks if it is fast it can be because of increased automaticity or increased reentry phenomena is the rhythm is regular or irregular when you are seeing any ecg then after rate it comes whether it is regular or irregular and if it is irregular then it it may be atrial fibrillation it may be second degree ev block it may be multifocal atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter with variable block these four things comes should come to your mind and third 
question comes into the mind is the qrs is narrow or wide third thing which you should think it is narrow or wide because if rhythm is narrow it means rhythm is from av node or above if qrs is narrow if it is wide it is coming from uh, may originate from anywhere basically it is coming from ventricle or diseased conduction system like a diseased purkinje system also can lead then fourth you have to look for are there any p wave if if there is absent p wave then it suggest atrial fibrillation ventricular tachycardia or rhythm originating from av node if you are not able to see clear cut p wave then these three things can be and fifth what is the relationship between p wave and qrs complex and if more p wave than qrs it suggests second and third degree wave block atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter and if more qrs than p wave then it is a isolated junctional rhythm maybe or ventricular tachycardia so these five point is very important when you are analyzing any rhythm strip then so now i am presenting a case a 32 year old female is treated in the emergency room for palpitation and the first ecg is this any of resident like to comment what what it can be the the diagnosis third year gr3 i think any of you who have been posted in cardiology i think cardiology professors and medicine professor both are here so you cannot speak like any comment anything as i have told simply see uh, rhythm is regular or irregular mic do beta mic do somebody can volunteer ha huh, you should volunteer first is re rate rate is uh, it is tachycardia or bradycardia tachycardia ha huh. rhythm is regular or irregular regular is qrs is narrow or narrow so what what it signifies uh, do you think it is a uh, sinus tachycardia no sir p wave uh, p wave is not no, visible not Then, svt ho sakta ha yes svt svt mein kitne type hote hain normally uh, av and rt av rt सुना होगा हाँ हाँ सर ए बी जैन बॉस हम लोग को पढ़ाते थे जब हम एम में थे ये डीएम थे तुम लोग को नहीं पढ़ाते हैं क्या नहीं पढ़ा रहे हैं बॉस आप अब ओम शंकर पढ़ा रहा होगा ठीक है तो ये देखो ये एनी केस अच्छा इसका आफ्टर ट्रीटमेंट ये हो गया इसका ई सी अब बताओ एनी केस आफ्टर द ट्रीटमेंट दिस इज द ई सी This is AV and RT or AV RT. AV and RT, AV RT. Make what difference? What is? Very poor performance. All of you don't deserve to be a product of IMS BHU. Very prestigious institute is BHU. So it is a AV and RT. You can see in AV and RT there is a re-entry within AV node. usually there is a fast pathway slow pathway when any uh, ectopic comes there is a block in one of the pathway then there is a re entry circuits in av node and here you can see at the end of qrs there is a bulge uh, pseudo s uh, pseudo r and pseudo s type up thing you can see in, in v1 v2 v3 it is suggestive of uh, av nrt and after cardioversion you can see there is no pre excited way although always it is not uh, uh, even manifest pre excitation is not necessary uh, sometime retrograde activation can occur in avrt and you can get the normal ecg even in avrt but if it is a normal ecg in that pattern that it is avrt so what is the arrhythmia avrt avrt atrial tachycardia and atrial fibrillation or sinus tachycardia sinus tachycardia is ruled out so this al algorithm is very important narrow qrs once you are getting this type of tachycardia see whether it is regular or not if it is regular whether you are able to see visible p wave or not and if it is a visible p wave then you have to see atrial rate is greater than uh, ventricular then it is atrial flutter or atrial tachycardia if it is not then you have to go for the rp interval and if it is a short then it is avnrt if it is a more than 70 mm 
then it can be AVRT, atypical avian RT or atrial tachycardia. So you have to, if it is irregular, then uh, uh, atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia with variable AV conduction or multifocal atrial tachycardia. And here you can see the pointer that is pseudo uh, uh, yes wave and R wave. So a small R dash is seen in lead V1, pseudo S wave is seen, that, that's why this is avian RT. Another patient, a 45 year old man comes into the emergency department complaining that his heart is racing with history of similar episodes since childhood. History is, is in childhood. This is the ECG. Any comment? It is SVT, but whether it is the avian RT or AVRT. Here you can see uh, P wave, retrograde P wave. It is some. Kaha par hai batao? Usme to ekdam pseudo R wave S wave dikha diya tha na? Isme batao kaha par hai? It is after some distance. You can see in V1 and V2. It is somewhat distant from the QRS. It means uh, the re-entry circuit is not in AV node. It is coming from the retrograde accessory pathway. So that's why it is a AVRT. You can see the uh, and after cardio version, you can see what is this ECG? Anyone? After cardio version, same patient. After giving the drug. Anything? Ye to bata do. Ye to MBBS wale bata dega. Koi wave dikh rahi hai? Aray, itna MCQ maar ke aaye hoge yaar. Bata do. Aray, delta wave nahi dikh rahi hai. Itna slurring dikh raha hai tumko V5, V6 mein. PR interval 60 hai. PR interval 60 hai. Slurring dekho. QRS ki af slurring dekho. V4 mein, V5 mein. V6 may, that is delta wave. So because narrow QRS and after conversion it is a delta wave is showing. So that's why it is a AVRT. But even if this ECG is normal, then it can be AVRT because there are some accessory pathway, they conduct only retrogradely. They don't have ability to conduct anti-gradely. So even with the normal ECG you can have uh, AVRT. But once it is there, then it is sure it is AVRT. So 60% AV or another hint is there. Uh, WPW is a one of a like a congenital phenomena. That's why there is a history, uh, there is a uh, racing from the childhood. So 60% is almost AVNRT, 30% is AVRT and approximately 10% is atrial tachycardia. A spontaneous conversion bhi ho jata hai. Adenosine is the drug of choice and diltiazem uh, and verapamil also can be used. I am not going much into detail. Final treatment is uh, uh, permanent cure is radiofrequency ablation. Case 3, a 70 year old male with a history of poor past MI and reduced LV function. History is very important. Patient with palpitation and dizziness and presentation blood pressure is 80 by 50 mmHg. Tell me what is the diagnosis? Rhythm is regular or irregular? QRS is wide or narrow? Wide. Then what, what should be the first uh, uh, diagnosis? Ventricular tachycardia. Because history of myocardial infarction, hypotension is there, then for all practical purposes, this is wide QRS tachycardia. So wide complex tachycardia, for all practical purposes, approximately two-third to 75% patient ventricular tachycardia, and apart from that, SVT with aberrancy, SVT with underlying bundle branch block, SVT with pre-excitation, integrate conduction when there is an excitation pathway directly conducting from the uh, atria to ventricle, then you will have the wide QRS. So these are the even post -maker, pacemaker patients, a lot of pacemakers are being implanted nowadays. These patients once they will have tachycardia, they will have wide complex, then you have to be watchful for the pacemaker spikes. So rate or presence, uh, absence of symptoms may be discriminated but always not helpful. So ECG criteria are very important. 
presence of risk factors like myocardial infarction is one of the very important factor. You should always, in the presence of MI, if there is a white QRS, this is VT, this is VT. Don't think otherwise. A lot of criteria, Brugada criteria is there. I will not go much in detail, detail but white QRS complex and atypical bundle branch type. The classical criteria of left bundle branch and, uh, and classical criteria of RBB is not there. It is a white QRS, it is uh, VT. If concordance, concordance means all QRS complex in V1 to V6 in a CM direction. If it is a negative concordance, 100% VT. If it is a positive concordance, 95% VT. Sometime, if there is a basal pre-excitation from the posterior LV to posterior LA, if there is a pathway is connecting, you can have positive concordance. But negative concordance, impossible in uh, pathways. So these are the some criteria. AVR is very helpful. Rabbit ear, if white QRS, atypical RBB, and first R is more than second R, then it is again favoring the VT. So this patient has a ventricular tachycardia, and if in any QRS complex, if RS interval greater than 100, then it is a uh, suggestive of VT. So how would you treat if patient is having hypotension and white QRS, then what will be the treatment of choice? DC shock. Good. Synchronized versus unsynchronized, kya hota hai? DC version? Do you have any idea? When we give synchronized cardio version, when we give non-synchronized? I think we need a detailed ECG workshop for these students. In case of VF, Synchronization, kisse synchronize karoge? Jab kuch to hai nahi hai, jab to maha pe dhenge na? Jaha pe QRS visual maha synchronize karenge. So, VT even can be stable. If it is a normal ejection fraction, then medical cardioversion can be tried. But mostly we prefer in case of VT, uh, DC cardioversion. Case 4, 84 year old man brought to emergency department after his wife noted that he was too dizzy. This is the CG. Tell me the diagnosis. This is the spot diagnosis. Syncope, 80 year old age, heart rate is slow. Huh? What is diagnosis? Huh, complete heart block because there is heavy dissociation. What will be the treatment? Pacemaker implantation, good. Because here atrial P wave, bradycardia and P wave is more than QRS. That is complete heart block. Agar tachycardia hota or QRS jada hota, P wave kam hota to VT ho jata. That, that, have, that is the conceptual thing which you have to keep in mind. So, this type of pacemaker, urgent pacemaker implantation is another patient, 63 year old female, acute onset palpitation and dizziness for last three hour, history of intermittent AF. This is the CG. What is that? Regular or irregular? Irregular. What will be the diagnosis? Most commonly it is atrial fibrillation. So in atrial fibrillation you have what objective or rate control versus rhythm control, cardioversion, anticoagulation. For all practical purposes in our setting we have to control the rate. If it is less than 48 hours then cardiovert it. If you are sure. If it is not then uh, go for the medical treatment for rate control and anticoagulation. Anticoagulation is must. And now the concept of uh, rhythm control is coming, gaining the popularity, but it, at our place, uh, we are not doing AF ablation very commonly. So it's still, we are. Case six, chest pain, 64 year old gentleman came to the casualty with severe chest pain since ha half an hour. His ECG report is like that, spot diagnosis, chest pain. ST elevation MI. Which MI? Anterior wall, posterior wall. Why? And what should be the treatment? Immediate treatment, what should be? Primary PCI or immediate thrombolysis by the STK or TNF These are all uh, anterior wall MI. I am not going much in detail which vessel is blocked and all because of time constraint. This is again uh, anterior wall MI. This 
This is CG, you tell which MI it is. I just want to sensitize since how, when patient comes with a symptom and what is CG and what look for. Inferior volume MI, good. And how to localize, localize the myocardium and CG, anterior lead, septal lead, lateral, inferior leads, uh, one AVL and V5, V6 is lateral lead, two, three AVF is inferior, V1, V2 is septal. And apart from ST elevation, uh, uh, myocardial infarction, other causes of ST elevation always you should keep in mind. Like pericarditis, early repolarization, left bundle branch block, LV aneurysm, Brugada. Because in these cases, uh, when you are deciding for thrombolysis, it may be dangerous. So you should keep close watch and you should know how to differentiate. How the ST segment elevation of pericarditis is different from the MI? Concave and apart from concavity, uh, another? Hmm? Good, good. Another case, a 66 year old gentleman came to casualty with the left sided chest pain 15 minutes. Similar episode 24 hours back. This is the ECG pattern what it is called as? That was a ST elevation MI, the, what it is? What it is called, a specific name for that? This is a dip, ST depression, uh, uh, depression and deep T wave inversion V1 to V6. Widow maker pattern, usually in the case of classical chest pain, if you are getting this type of ECG, it, it means proximal left anterior descending artery is 90-99% closed. So these patients where you, you have to be careful. In any adult male T-wave inversion after the age of 10 years, any T-wave inversion extending beyond V1 is abnormal. In female it can be up to V2, uh, up to 30 years of age. But in male after 10 years of age any T-wave inversion extending beyond V1, it is abnormal, it should be taken seriously. Case number eight, 70 year old diabetic male presented with chest pain and diaphoresis. Again this ECG, I, I am showing all important ECG which you should not miss in your clinical practice, whether you are going to become endocrinologist or nephrologist. This is very important and very dangerous ECG. AVR is up, you can see AVR is elevated and diffuse ST segment elevation. In this type of case, eh, patients, you will have multivessel disease, left vein with multivessel disease. And these type of patients should be very early need to be admitted and stabilized and subjected to NGO and followed by the uh, multivessel PCI or CABG. I am showing you the typical ECGs which, which you should uh, remember in your life uh, lifelong. A 35 year old male patient with effort, breathlessness and syncope and family history of sudden death. These are the two ECG and one is uh, ECO and another is MRI picture. What can, uh, can be the diagnosis? A, A and C and B and D. Family history of sudden death, effort, breathlessness. Huh? A, 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 what will the diagnosis? Who is saying? HOCM. And the B and D? What will happen? RV is so big. RV is also written. And in V1 to V3, there is a deep T-wave inversion. Male patient. Now I have told you that male patient has a history of breathlessness and family history of sudden death. Any young patient where family history of sudden death and history of breathlessness what does this mean? There is a structural substrate and ECG is also bad. So these are two entities. If it is a Brugada, then it will not be breathlessness. That's why I am emphasizing. If it is a structural heart disease, then it will be breathlessness. So if it is a history of breathlessness, sudden death, young age, then in your mind, either it is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or ARVD, ethnogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And in right lead T-wave inversion, is there then it will support to the diagnosis of ARVD in ECG. If ECG is looking like a LVH and patient is not having hypertension, then you should always suspect the SCM. 
and you can have concentric hypertrophy in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you have to be a strong clinical suspicion should be there. Case number 10. I am trying to show the classical cases which you, which you should not miss. A 25 year old male, history of syncope with a family history of sudden death and normal echo. Echo is normal. Family is male history, male hai, history of syncope hai, family history of sudden death and normal echo. Brugada syndrome. You, Brugada syndrome come in your mind. It is very common. And you will have ST segment elevation in V1, V2 classical. Sometime you cannot have. And fever is very important. Uh, in, in the presence of fever, sometime Brugada pattern comes out. So, and otherwise it may be normal. Sometime it's easy doing one uh, intercostal space up, up can bring out the Brugada type of changes. So this is very important. And this may be type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 is a classical. Type 2 is a saddleback type. Sometimes quinidine and procanamide drug can be given to bring out the Brugada type of changes into the manifest ECG. And another entity after Brugada, a structurally normal heart, long QT syndrome, you should always keep in mind. And short QT syndrome. There's a long list of LQT, uh, LQT1, LQT2, LQT3, and classical triggering factor. If it is a LQT1 during exercise, and LQT2 upon alarming sound, sound on telephone ring, telephone ring hua, marish ko ho gaya. That is a LQT2. And during sleep, LQT3 syndrome. So you should know. And these can present with the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So long QT with polymorphic VT, it is a long QT. And if it is a polymorphic VT, normal QT, it is a ischemia. Immediate angiography and you have to rule out the ischemia. That's how you have to differentiate. Pre-excited atrial fibrillation, like an integrated accessory pathway, if patient is having, and directly a AF is conducting over the accessory pathway, you can have the similar ECG. And as uh, Dr. Vikas, uh, in, in her, uh, his ECG presentation, uh, rhythm disorder in pregnancy, have told, CPVT, patient during the exercise, have the uh, arrhythmia. So classically, bidirectional VT, as you are getting in relaxing toxicity, similarly, one QRS is up, one QRS is down, alternately. This is a classical of CPVT. During TMT, you can, if, if you will ask patient to do TMT, you will can get the, this type of ECG. So this is the diagnostic of CPVT. And uh, treatment of choice is ICD and beta blocker. Few another example, two or three, case 11, 45 year old female, posted part cholecystectomy. This type of ECG, you may get LAHB and lot of RBB finding. When patient, you get the surgical concentration and ECG shows abnormalities and how to react. So, you have to rule out all these causes. Uh, right ventricular hypertrophy, any history of cardiomyopathy, if any abnormality in ECG comes, I think these patients should be thoroughly looked for before giving the surgical reference. LVBB. LVBB is, uh, should never be ignored because if, if there is a LVBB, there is a 50% chances of uh, LV dysfunction. So LVBB is more dangerous than RBB in chronic setting. So take home point as an emergency, we must be able to identify common but potentially dangerous ECG abnormality and initiate appropriate therapy. Identification of these patterns require a detailed evaluation of entire ECG and not just a quick scan for abnormal CT STD changes. So for what you are doing, ordering the ECG, and you, this is very important. That's what I uh, given you a 12 representative uh, problems and ECG. I think it, it will be very helpful for all of you. Thank you. Thank you all for patience hearing. So uh, I think end of the Heart India Conclave. And before that, I will request uh, Dr. Uh, Jitain to give memento to Dr. Vikas Agrawal, sir. I request Dr. Arup Das Gupta to give memento to Dr. Dharmen Jain, sir.
I will request Dr. M. K. Srivastava to give memento to Dr. Arup Das, young dynamic physician of Varanasi. I request Dr. Deepak Gautam to give memento to Dr. Jitend. With these, uh, I think this marathon academic event have come to an end, and I will like to thank all of you who have spared their own time for this academic feast, and all of you are invited for dinner. Thank you.